Okay. I Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, you understand? You understand me? Okay, welcome everybody to this event. This evening it follows a similar event we held uh, two weeks ago, which was attended by 250 people. This conference is organized by Emancipation, Journal for Eco Socialist Strategy by the Movement for Socialism, the Spanish uh, Revista or Journal Viento Sur, and the International Socialist Organization in Germany. My name is Christian Seller. I work at the University of Salzburg, and I am a member of the editorial board of the just recently relaunched journal Emancipation. The Ukrainian resistance has so far prevented the occupation of the country. The Russian army currently focuses its invasion on the east and south of the Ukraine. However, its basic aim consists still in destroying the Ukrainian resistance and in denying the Ukrainian nationality. This war has taken many socialists and leftists in Europe and North America by surprise. Even uh, after almost two months, many still find it difficult to take the stand. Many leftists take refuge in abstract and unrealistic wishes. They describe the war as a war between imperialist great powers. They reject both sides equally. Also, they reject Russia's attack, of course, they refuse to support the Ukrainian resistance. They refuse to supply arms to Ukraine, even though Russia can continue to rearm re itself and to strengthen itself. Many even oppose sanctions against Russian oligarchs because that would mean siding with NATO. Some argue that arm deliveries would only prolong the war. This position, to my view, is first an invitation to Ukraine's surrender, and second, factually wrong or incorrect. Such positions are far from reality in Ukraine, and they contribute, unfortunately, to discrediting Western, Europe, Western European socialists in the eyes of many people or the population in Ukraine and other countries in Eastern Europe. So calls for ceasefire also sound sometimes, sometimes helpless. As we well known, as it's well known, ceasefires are conduct, concluded based on power relations, on a balance of power. And this balance of power, of course, must improve politically, socially, and even, of course, militarily in favor of the resistance in Ukraine. 
If Ukraine had the appropriate means, it would be able to repel the Russian attack and inflict the necessary defeat of the Putin regime, exactly because of the socially broad-based resistance of the Ukrainian population. With this conference, we want to make a very modest contribution to this process of changing power relations. But the challenge, of course, is very fundamental and huge. Because the Russian regime is counting on planned mass terror and even annihilation uh, of a part of, of, of the infrastructure and of population. Putin denies even the right of, uh, Ukrainian, of the Ukrainian nation to exist. Our aim with this event is to make the voices of socialists in Ukraine and in Russia heard in Western Europe especially in the German-speaking countries, but of course also in other countries, let them have their say. We translate this event into German. All speakers uh, speak English. We translate it in German, in French, in Italian and in Spanish. First, I welcome Sachar Popovic. He is active in the political organization Sozialny Ruch, a social movement. Uh, afterwards, I also welcome Alona Viasheva. She is a sociologist and editor of the Commons Journal of Social Criticism. Unfortunately, uh, Taras Pilush uh, cannot be with us and uh, either uh, Oksana Duczak. But uh, I'm sure that Sachar and Alona will uh, re replace them uh, in an excellent manner. Then we have uh, Yulia Yurchenko with us. She is a senior lecturer in political economy at University of Greenwich in UK. And currently she is in Ukraine. Uh, then we turn to the Russian side. I welcome Sasha. She is a PhD student active in the Russian socialist movement and uh, in the feminist movement in Russia. And finally, I welcome Simon Pirani. He is a honorary professor at the University of Durham in the UK. And he is also author of a recently published book it's uh, with the title Burning Up, a Global History of Fossil Fuel consumption. And he is a lifelong activist in the labor movement. So we organize this event as follows. Each speaker will make a short introduction of about 10 minutes at the beginning. Afterwards, uh, uh, each speaker is welcome to uh, make some additional comments or remarks to the presentations of the other speakers. Then we turn to the questions of the public or interventions. We organize the event in, this, in the style of a webinar. So please use the question and answer function in, in Zoom. And uh, the speakers, the panelists are invited to respond to these questions. And um, I will collect uh, the, the questions and present them to the, to the panelists, to the speakers. Uh, so if you have questions and contributions to debate, please write your remarks or your questions uh, to the questions and answer, answer functions uh, you see on the bottom of your screen. Uh, Comrades from the Movement of Socialism, Eva and Philip, will help me to collect the questions and to bring them to back together. And so I wish you a fruitful uh, this debate. And uh, we will close at about nine o'clock, a little bit later, probably 10 minutes, because we, we started 10 minutes later. And I hope uh, this event will be a further contribution to establishing very important links between Eastern and Western Europe. Thus, please, uh, Zachar Popovic, uh, please start with your uh, 
presentation on the current situation in in Ukraine, on the situation of the resistance, on also the activities of your organization, Sozialny Duch. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, yeah, so my name is Zakhar Popovich. Yeah, Taras Bilous, who should speak at this event, is in the army now and he is not available for online event today. I'm neither in army nor in territorial defense because I'm ineligible due to health reasons, health conditions. Uh, so I will speak instead of Taras. And uh, I am a co-founder of social movement. And uh, as a researcher, I was involved in research in labor relations in Ukraine and profit shifting by oligarchs uh, from Ukraine during the iron ore export and other things. Okay, so today I should speak about the current events and situation in Ukraine as, as it is now. I'm in Kiev in 1957, so around 20 minutes ago, air defense alarm was declared here in Kiev. Uh, strikes are rare here in downtown uh, due to air defense, but are still possible, you know. You know that uh, there are still uh, Russian missiles targeting uh, the city, not, not the very center of the city, but still there are casualties, there are people dead. Last week, uh, the strikes are even intensified a little bit, yeah. But, okay, I, sh I will try to speak about the situation uh, generally, yeah, not about <laughs> the city where I'm from and where I am now. So, uh, what, what we have, yeah, what we, we have uh, generally an unprecedented union, unity of Ukrainian people, yeah, against the full-scale foreign aggression, yeah. So millions of people donate personal funds to support army. There, you know, strong public sentiment uh, for Ukrainian fighters and against the Russian invaders. Yeah. So, and of course, the hostility against Russian soldiers and against Russia and the Russian people are growing. Yeah, unfortunately, probably, but it is reasonable. Yeah, and. Uh, we as social movement, uh, we are supporting the Ukrainian effort as, as a national liberation struggle, as a true national liberation struggle against imperialist aggression. Uh, we are sure that now, at the moment, there, are, there is only one imperialist army on the Ukrainian territory, and we should fight it. And uh, uh, in our op opinion, the Ukrainian, well, the Ukrainian army is engaged in severe fighting now, yeah? and uh, the victory of Ukrainian army, military victory, will mean victory for all anti-imperialist forces in the world, in our point of view, and possibly gives us a chance uh, to challenge the imperialist system as a whole. Yeah? We understand the role of Western imperialism in uh, many other cases, possibly in provoking this situation, but I will stand once again that at the moment now there is only one imperialist in Ukraine and we should fight it. So our organization is involved in humanitarian activities. Uh, our comrades in Lviv are trying to support uh, refugees with food, with uh, mm, uh, some necessary supplies. Our comrades in Khmelnytsky, in Kiev, in um, other cities were involved in, uh, in supporting not only refugees, but some territorial defense units, mostly with not uh, the military equipment, but some necessary supplies. Yeah. One of the uh, most important pro projects uh, of our organization is the uh, labor defense, yes, yeah? so we are trying to provide uh, the <clears throat> our lawyers, yeah, as a leader of our organization, the head of the social movement is uh, Vitaly Dudin, who is a lawyer, and um, he and other uh, people are trying to provide the support for Ukrainians who lost jobs or face uh, uh, <clears throat> 
unlawful firing or not payment of salary because of all the situation to, to uh, support their rights. And, uh, you know, probably the most important thing what social uh, movement is also doing is, is the project of Yulia Yurchenka on, on the uh, effort to promote the cancelling of Ukrainian debt, which is, which is very important for Ukraine. But of course, Yulia will, will speak about it. So I will continue about, about what is going on here in Ukraine. Yeah? So as we speak, people are dying in Donbass. People are dying in Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Kherson regions, and very intensively in uh, Lugansk and Donetsk regions of Donbass. Thousands of civilians are already dead. Yeah? Many hundreds of children are dead. Many people are wounded. Yeah? Many people are in hospitals and disabled for life, yeah? So millions of refugees, yeah? Millions uh, of refugees inside Ukraine uh, with new and new waves of people evacuating with uh, railway system and by their own means. Well, you know that uh, millions left Ukraine uh, to Poland, uh, Romania and uh, mostly to Poland, yeah, many, many millions of Ukrainians left the country. <sighs> yeah, so uh, more recently, uh, probably you, people who, who follow the events uh, knew about the massive killings of civilians in the northern suburbs of Kiev, yeah? the territories uh, that were, you know, liberated, uh, freed from Russian, uh, Russian army, uh, the massive mass graves uh, were found and uh, some mass, particularly in Bucha and in Borodyanka and some other uh, cities and uh, towns near Kiev. <clears throat> and uh, of course, investigation is going on and some people name it the genocide. I'm not sure about the uh, specific name of it, but it is, it is uh, really massive killings of civilians, which are which were absolutely not a danger for, for Russian, uh, Russian soldiers who killed them. Uh, yeah, of course, the uh, situation is uh, also not, not, not that uh, <laughs> uh, unanimous yeah, in country. And um, we have some cases of violence uh, where the territorial defense unit and other armed units were involved uh, in, you know, some possibly struggles against the business or political opponents. Uh, for example, it was event in, um, in Lviv uh, yesterday, I think, when some uh, people, armed people with private sector signs uh, attacked the volunteers who were distributing food to refugees, possibly because these volunteers are connected to the left-wing anarchist organizations. So uh, the, the, there are some cases, unfortunately. And uh, of course, uh, it is a, there are attempts from a neoliberal part of, of government to push a new anti-social labor legislation and deregulation measures. Yeah. Uh, Luckily, we have no strict unity inside the ruling party in this question. And it was voting today in parliament and new labor deregulation bill was not supported. Uh, it, was not, uh, it was not enough votes to pass. Yeah, so this is a good news and this is a big luck actually. Uh, in the morning, I think that, you know, the battle against the deregulation is over, but <laughs> for some reason, um, because of we have no unity in 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 uh, ruling party, it is still possible to. Uh, okay, and so I will I will uh, try to to wrap, wrap up. Yeah, and I would say that Ukrainian army is uh, now engaged in severe fighting, and it is running out of ammunition because of very intensive fighting. The Russian, uh, the Ukrainian army is engaged in defense battle. Yeah, Russians are now uh, oh, performing a big offensive against Donbas. Defeat of Ukrainian forces will mean 
more dead civilians and bloody, bloody occupation regime in white territories. We will have more butchers in case of defeat of Ukrainian army. So we call arm Ukraine now. This is my introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Saka, for this uh, very um, uh, concrete uh, uh, report about the situation in, in Ukraine and your arguments for uh, really uh, defeating uh, the Russian army. Now I turn to Alona. She is uh, a sociologist in Kiev and she works with the journal um, uh, Commons, the Commons Journal uh, and she will uh, uh, bring us or she will present us some features about the current uh, the social situation and also the different aspects of resistance in population self-organization and probably also some elements about um, women's and feminist uh, organizations. Yeah, it's thanks not, a lot. Uh, sorry, I forget. I forgot something at the very beginning. Uh, organizational issue uh, in regard uh, to the translation or the interpretation. You find if you want to choose German or French or another language, you put you go to the button at uh, the bottom of the page uh, at Zoom, and there you can choose uh, the other language. And if you have questions, do not use the chat, because we use the chat for organizational issues. Use the question and answer, or question and answer, or Frage und Antwort button, also uh, on the bottom of the, of, the way, of the page. But it's your turn, Aruna. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting our journal. Unfortunately, Aksana does not feel well today, so she passed me, uh, you know, the opportunity to speak about what we observe here and what we analyze here in Ukraine. I am uh, currently based in Lviv and I'm based here for last, I'm Kiev and myself, so I share the pain uh, of Zahar about our city, uh, which was severely attacked, but uh, I'm best based in Lviv for last uh, four years and I met the war here and this perspective from Lviv really gives me opportunity to see rather the social effects of the war because as you might know Lviv became this hub for refugees, uh, this uh, hub for people who are hiding from, drafted, uh, from being drafted to the army and I'm gonna focus on like three main um, issues. First of all, it's housing. Uh, then it's like uh, mental health issues and uh, gender issues. Um, I'm a housing researcher, so probably my expertise in housing is uh, like uh, way more structured. Uh, to explain the context that Ukraine uh, since uh, I would say middle of 90s had a uh, very neoliberal housing policy which could be rather described as like policy to support the real estate sector than the housing policy itself. Um, housing sector, like housing stock was uh, privatized almost by 99%. Such things as social housing or some uh, non, <coughs> sorry, I'm gonna be coughing from time to time. Um, such, such things as like non-profit housing did not exist here before the war and of course when this huge crisis I mean I mean hu humanitarian crisis in the whole country started it was very difficult to for the state to even if they wanted to help the refugees if they wanted to host the refugees they basically did not know how to do it because there was no tradition of regulating the rent market or providing uh, affordable housing and so on. And basically this function was uh, absorbed by the civil society uh, 
we are still observing like a very high level of self-organization in order to house the refugees, in order to provide them like basic things apart from the home itself, uh, completely for free. So in, like apart from, you know, supporting the army, I can see how Ukrainians are now inventing a uh, social welfare state, how they're inventing social housing, for example, as a phenomenon, without even knowing the word, uh, small local initiatives organize themselves to help people to come in to the relatively uh, safe regions. Um, apart from this, there are also a lot of um, <coughs> uh, initiatives from the municipal government to help uh, to house refugees. But the problem is that this like local initiatives, they're not being scaled up. And this is something which like also a question of which, you know, uh, part of the government be more involved in housing policy during the war and after the war. Because of course now there will be a need to rebuild many things. There will be a need uh, to build a housing for displaced people and there and now we can see this debate and it goes on not only on the like national level but it also goes on the international level because of course a, uh, a lot of rebuilding will uh, come will be funded by the international aid uh there are already discussions on how to spend the money you know and i uh, like you know the left um, like left-leaning researchers on housing like like me we're getting ready for this like severe fight to get to the government to show them that housing market is not the only solution that we also need to think about non-profit housing um and that's what's, you know, gonna uh, wait for us in the future. And of course, this question of rebuilding is very much connected to the uh, rebuilding through the international aid is very much connected to the question of uh, cancellation of debt. But I'm not gonna go um, there. I've already spent five minutes. <coughs> so yeah, that's like the situation with the social sector and like, on the example of housing, we can see this conflict inside of Ukraine. Uh, of course, another issues uh, which were brought by the war is how the lifestyle, like everyday life experiences, how they changed. Of course, apart from, you know, such obvious problems as being displaced, as losing your home, as losing your family members and friends, there is also, and I'm talking now even about more or less safe regions like Western Ukraine, there is this atmosphere of fear, atmosphere of uh, instability, um, of, of uh, precariousness of your life. And that's what uh, really affects a lot of people. And of course, first of all, people who had some mental health issues before, now it could be seen how this, um, you know, in the air, there is this feeling of that you do not know what's gonna happen to you, to your family. <clears throat> and, and unfortunately, there is also not any like uh, organized response from the institutions, um, <clears throat> but but at the same time, uh, similarly to many other aspects, there is a strong response from the activists. Now it's like very easy to find uh, a therapist online who is going to work with you for free and so on. But it's also, um, I think, this kind of. Uh, challenges which we're facing now they're gonna follow us in the future because basically the whole society is gonna carry this trauma and does and 
including of course in including those who even did not face you know like bombings including those who managed to leave the country mm, and it's uh, i think a big question for the future and you know it's also seen how this um, social aspects of living through the war they affect women uh, more because um, women are um, expected to perform this like caring position and uh, if ukraine i mean that, that especially for, for for the last 10 years it could be seen how like progressive uh gender regime is being built in ukraine how these questions of gender equality being raised up now because of the war because of the violence we made a step back and a huge step back uh the new gender regime tells us that men have to go to fight women have to take care of kids and uh, all others um the army reform was not uh, um, efficient in including women on the in the army on the like uh, on the same even like i don't know there there are women in the army but it's rather um, you know more a public like a picture for the public yet that yeah we did reach some level of gender equality in the army but it's not the case army it's still ukrainian army is still super hierarchical patriarchal structure and even if they're women they're still are being on the lower positions and we uh also we'll see in the future probably this war i mean this war will transform ukrainian army for sure um but now it's like difficult to say what is the position of women in the army but it does not look that they're you know having some uh, um, real practical equality. Um, so yeah, I'm running out of time and probably we could talk about this like new gender regime later. And yeah, thanks for organizing this. I'm happy to listen to my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Alona, for this uh, additional picture on, on the current situation in Ukraine. Uh, now I turn to Yulia Yurchenko. She is a political economist in the UK, but currently she lives in Venetia, in the city of Venetia, and about one, uh, 150 kilometers southwest of Kiev. And probably some of you know there is an interesting connection between Venetia and Zurich because some years ago the city of Zurich provided uh, the old, some old tramways to the city of Venetia. So in, the, in Venetia you see these blue white tramways which have been before in which were before in Zurich. But uh, it's your, uh, your turn, Julia. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, indeed, uh, the trams are, are a great feature. And, uh, you know, I always liked trams growing up because they were a reliable type of transport and they still are. And uh, I, I also want to tell you that the local tram and trolleybus depot have started making innovations on top of those trams. Uh, and uh, there are some kind of like newer designs of the bases. So they, there is speaking of resilience and innovations, you know, there are, there are people making matter, taking matters in their own hands and they're kind of trying to with whatever limited resources they have. Sometimes they're not as limited, sometimes they are. They're trying to actually be creative and do things and and come across uh, and kind of and come through. And I was uh, actually talking about this with Eleona the other day that the uh, this the uh, with through, through the initiative of the local uh, tram and trolley bus depot, they have um, uh, the the city has managed to extend its uh, electric transport trolley bus line by some extra twenty kilometers because they have figured out that 
you know, uh, like the, the trolley bus can go without being attached to the wire for a while because there is a there is an accumulator there is a battery in each of them so they started they started building bigger batteries and they even managed to extend the the line of the electric transport without having to build additional wires uh, additional kind of wiring for them because they can last longer without being connected to the grid like it's 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 re it's really quite quite exciting and kind of improving on designs it's it's really great and it's good to have these partnerships with different cities and you know do a bit of um uh machinery and technology transfer and the rest of it but i've um, i actually want to update uh, everyone because uh, i've i've just come back from ukraine last night uh and i'm in london today so I was uh, I was in Kiev when the war started. Uh, I left on the same day. I was part of that wave of people fleeing um, fleeing the incoming war. Uh, then I was in Vinitsa for about till about a week ago, and then I came to Lviv for a couple of days, and I saw Alona there and a couple of other activists. And then, together with uh, another excellent uh, activist woman, Nina Patarska, I have left uh, to through Krakow to to through Poland uh, um, a couple of days ago. And last night, I finally got home, and I'm still sort of getting my head together because a lot is going on, and it's really it's really trying. There are some important meetings to be held outside Ukraine as part of the uh, debt cancellation campaign that I will I will tell you in the next eight minutes or so that I've got left and um, and I'm planning to go back to Ukraine within the next few weeks to continue this important work with Social Neruch uh, that I'm also part of and uh, continue building bridges with other left-wing organizations and platforms including the uh, um, Ukraine solidarity campaign that's based in the UK that I'm part of here and we organize meetings and briefings with parliamentarians, we organize demonstrations, we raise awareness of what's going on in Ukraine and challenge those um, skewed narratives that you have opened up with Christian. So without any further ado, I'm going to jump into what I wanted to say about what I'm uh, doing and about like, the state of the Ukrainian economy. So first of all, I think what, what's important for us to understand is that in 91, when Ukraine became an independent country, following an all-national referendum that overwhelmingly supported such a development, the country was a developed, educated, advanced economy with fully deployed infrastructure and public services. Um, with, well, of course, there was still, you know, room for improvement, but it was nevertheless a very serious, a very, a very advanced economy with highly educated labor force. Vinitsa, the city where I grew up, had its own chemical plant, had its own radiotechnical plant. You know, my, my father worked in a construction bureau that worked on technology on moving from uh, analog to digital technologies uh, that was in the 80s, right? So there was there was lots of uh, lots of important stuff happening uh, across the country, not just in a couple of concentrated industrial areas, and a lot of that uh, capacity has been depleted uh, through uh, so-called market reforms. So. By the time that Russia went with this next phase of invasion into so on the 24th of February, uh, Ukraine was already it, from from the most from the most promising post-Soviet country in '91, according to various reports. Economically speaking, it was it became it was the poorest and the most indebted country in Europe. Um, and the budget, and of course, uh, because of the war, the budgetary expenditure on arms, humanitarian needs, and medical needs of of the wounded have, have of the wounded have grown exponentially. Um, the scale of GDP contraction in April was projected by the World Bank at forty five percent. This is this is for for this year alone. And uh, again, you know, this this is this was in April. Like the war isn't over. We do not know the full scale of, and with the extent of this contraction yet. Uh, and the Prime Minister of Ukraine on the 29th of March already estimated that the one-off direct, one-off, uh, like one-off uh, direct um, damage due to the invasion is, has already then exceeded one trillion US dollars, which which is astronomical, of course. Uh, and again, this is not a precise estimate, of course, because the fighting is going on, and there are a lot of areas that are being occupied still. Uh, and we simply do not know the full assessment and, and the scale of the destruction. So, of course, a lot of money will be needed for Ukraine's uh, homes and infrastructure to be rebuilt uh, and for the cleanup and decontamination of cities in the countryside to happen, because, of course, warfare is extremely ecocidal and the, the decontamination of, uh, of, uh, of a lot of areas will need to happen. And there are already 
lot of estimates that up to a third of arable land is not possible to be used this this year. And of course, a lot of it is due to fighting, but a lot of it is due to the contamination as well. So, of course, um, uh, a lot, there are a lot of problems that uh, Ukraine is facing right now, and it's losing a lot of infrastructure, industrial and agricultural capacity, its import and export capacity is being disrupted, and also it's very heavily leaking cadre, it's, heavy, it's leaking human resources, it's, uh, uh, there, there is a serious reorganization of societal fabric, some of which uh, Alona already touched upon, uh, across sexed and gendered uh, and in various intersectional lines, uh, that will be reflected. Uh, for the years to come in how the country is being organized. So first of all, I also want to, not first of all, but I also want to add that when we're talking about, when we're trying to understand where the weaknesses of Ukraine's economy are, we need to think about what our frame of analysis is, because um, there has been a lot of talk uh, in the discussion of the post-Soviet economies about transition to the market, as if we are kind of starting from tabula rasa from point zero. What I suggest is that in, instead, what we need to be um, talking about is developing a nuanced understanding of the compound effects on public, of public services reforms, their nature and variegated geographically and economically, and even sex and gender effects in in, in Ukraine and other post-Soviet states as well. Um, and we need to, when we look at the kind of reorganization uh, of the housing stock, like uh, I don't know, already mentioned, of the scientific technological base, uh, of the infrastructure, we need to be talking about systemic, 30 years of systemic de-development uh, in Ukraine and other post-Soviet economies, because a lot of the advances and, and, uh, and development that has been achieved has been rolled back. So while we're looking at the advances and uh, improvements, we also need to discount it against the de-development of certain societal achievements. But let's go back to today. Ukraine remains one of the most poor, one of the poorest and most indebted countries. In Europe, as I already mentioned, uh, this year uh, alone, it will need about 4.8 billion in external financing to weather the deep recession. This is IMF assessment, and again, the, it will be it will need more than that. Uh, in 22 alone, Ukraine needs 2.7 billion dollars just to pay IMF and World Bank on its debts, um, and. Uh, and they are not even the biggest debt holders, like most, uh, more, more than a half of Ukraine's uh, foreign debt is with private, um, it was with private investors. Uh, the biggest one before the war was Fra Franklin Templeton, so the foreign debt is also quite heavily concentrated, which means that certain investors yield a lot of power in uh, how debt is being managed. Russia is a big holder of Ukraine's foreign debt, so it's it's like it's a very complex picture when we're trying to understand kind of what's going on with the country's finances. So your expenses explode and you're heavily indebted and your, and your economy is on the brink of a default, yet our finance minister refuses to talk about, uh, about debt cancellation. So a lot of campaigning that I do through Social Network with our friends uh, from other left uh, European parties, and campaigns, uh, Razam are our excellent partners. Like, you know, the narratives and like the debt cancellation campaign and International Committee on Debt, uh, on, on illegitimate debt, like this kind of campaigning that we're trying to do, the Ministry of Finance just don't want to hear about it. They're trying to do this kind of strange, stoic thing of insisting on, on honoring debt payments, even though Ukraine's economy, land, and human bodies are fighting the war on, on behalf of the rest of Europe and, and, and arguably the world right now. Um, so Ukraine, due to chaotic borrowing and debt, uh, explo uh, and, and debt uh, expansion, uh, uh, not least because of, uh, as a result of the oligarchic state capture and kleptocracy in the 90s, has, land, has landed up in this uh, situation of toxic debt dependency. Uh, and of course, a, a lot of loans, especially with IMF and World Bank, they come with very strict conditionalities on what you can and cannot spend money on. And we're talking about uh, years and years and years of austerity, again, erosion of social reproduction base, um, uh, gro economic growth at expense of ec ecological destruction and so on and so forth. So that servicing right now is not possible for Ukraine unless it forfeits the needs of its military and its most urgent needs needs of its people. Um, uh, but at the same time, a different way of doing things is possible. The debt needs to be written off. I'm going to take 
30 seconds and uh, and then we can move into discussion because I do not want to take too much time. Ukraine is, is, is limited by a lot of conditionality with its foreign partners, including the EU, because of the uh, rules of engagement that are, that are written into the Deep Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. But what it needs right now is, that, is its debts written off it needs multi-scale of uh, multi, multi -scale, large scale and multifaceted international assistance uh, and and conditionality facility and condition conditionality uh, with these different organizations need to be changed from uh, demands of austerity to what they call in IMF is fiscal activism or measures aimed at stabilizing business cycles through discretionary use of fiscal policy. Ukraine's government should be enabled to actually center its social needs, its ecological needs, and, and the redevelopment of what has been destroyed. That needs to happen because austerity in the wartime is uneconomical and it is unecological, uh, especially in, in, a, in the name of debt servicing. There's been, uh, the, uh, there's been uh, a bilateral mechanism set up with help of IMF and the Canadian government for cash donations to Ukraine's government. And there's be, there is a mechanism for special drawing rights to be donated through IMF to Ukraine, but th that money shouldn't be spent on servicing debts. This is, it's immoral, it's uneconomical, and that, that should stop. Uh, G7 announced that they will give Ukraine 24 billion US dollars in 22 to help the economy. But again, that shall not be spent on debts. That money should be spent on supporting people, on supporting the army in its fight, in the, in the fight for the self-preservation of the country. And, um, uh, and also what, what we need um, is a serious historical materialist and eco-social critique of global debt and policy conditionality regime, the black holes of offshore and global financial architectures through which money that should be spent in the country gets funneled out. And we need a serious proposal of potential plan, uh, plan case that, uh, that can be followed for construction of similar economies elsewhere, because Ukraine is not the first and unlike, likely not the last country that finds itself in such a difficult situation. So we need to be learning a lot a lot here. Um, I'm going to stop here. There is there is lots of other stuff that I could be saying, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you for having me here and for listening. Uh, Julia, thank you very much for this uh, short overview of some very fundamental economic uh, challenges of, of Ukraine. Now we turn to Russia. We have uh, Sasha with us. She is a PhD, PhD student and she is a feminist activist and she is also uh, active in, in the anti-war movement and uh, the movement, the socialist movement. So uh, you can provide us a picture of the current situation in Russia. Just two weeks ago, Ilya Budraitskis already draw a very dark picture of the situation in Russia and the evolution of the Russian regime. Uh, now you can provide us with a concrete picture also of the resistance and main, mostly also resistance of women against the war. Mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting, um, well, having me here. And I was uh, glad to see my comrades from um, Sozialne Ruch and uh, Commons. Um, and yeah, so I will uh, briefly talk maybe, uh, so I'm a member of Russian Socialist Movement and uh, also a member of uh, Feminist Anti-War Resistance. And um, as not to be repetitive, I will not go into details about current uh, political situation in Russia. I might only want to summarize what have happened during these two weeks. So was from the very beginning of the war, around 100 criminal cases were initiated for any uh, for different types of anti-war activities. So it's um, 100 cases from the beginning of the war. And uh, but also we see that, for example, there is no much of pro-war 
grassroots mobilization, the one that we can see these horrible Z signs or any other flash mob actions, they are actually very much pushed and promoted by the state. And uh, so far, we can, of course, see people who are reporting other people uh, who are protesting, for example, but these numbers are not growing that dramatically, maybe, as we were afraid of. Um, at the same time, we can see sort of radicalization of the protest because again during these two weeks we saw number of trains that were derailed in russia number of fires in um, or around governmental buildings or near military institutions and uh, uh, the one fire was set in at the local military registration and en enlistment office uh, so the where new soldiers are conscripted so we can see kind of these signs of more radical um protest during the last week more maybe some sort of violent in russia but we don't know who are these people uh and uh, whether they are connected or not with the war anti-war activity but we can see that like the situation is getting more and more intense in russia um and uh, finally, uh, what I wanted to say about the main situation is that uh, public sociology laboratory, um, independent research uh, collective, uh, recently published their first results of the interviews with people who support the war. And uh, they, they have an interesting hypothesis that actually lots of people um, who believe or trust Russian propaganda, they tend to change their opinion and the evaluation of the situation as the war unfolds. Uh, so maybe the situation is not that gloomy anymore or in Russia, or I'm just uh, uh, absolutely crazy optimist, or I'm just coming from the perspective of resistance. And that's why I want to fo focus on some uh, positive uh, possibilities for us. So feminist anti-war resistance was uh, launched on 25th of February, uh, on the second day of the war. And uh, we published, we started with the manifesto, uh, which was later translated into 20 languages and we got lots of public attention um of course um and then uh we were at the beginning we were happy and what we are doing we are organizing different types of everyday resistance uh our channel telegram channel which has thirty thousand subscribers now and it keeps growing uh we use as a platform for a safe exchange of ideas of different activists and uh, our movement is um, not very structured. We actually used this uh, very loose infrastructure of feminist movement in Russia as our advantage. And people just have affinity groups, local affinity groups that are not very well connected with each other, but they communicate to the movement through our boat. Uh, a telegram bot where they can write safely whatever they want and we can circulate their ideas, leaflets, stickers, whatever, suggestions for the actions. And uh, some of the actions that were launched by the feminist anti-war movement were actually suggested by some of our activists in different um, Russian cities. Um, as for a number of activists, we actually don't know how many of us are in Russia, uh, but normally our actions take place place in something around 100 cities in Russia. Uh, so you can kind of count and already there are several um, cases initiated against our activists in Russia and different types of, uh, some of them are fines, others, uh, yeah, most of them are fines or um, detentions for um, some short period. Um, anyways, um, we do these things in Russia and our goal is to mobilize uh, Russian anti-war activities, to exchange ideas, to do it as safe as possible. And then we were giving lots of interviews for Western media as well as a feminist anti-war resistance. And finally, at some point, uh, very soon, luckily, we realized uh, the point why we are in such a high demand. Um, and the point is that as a anti-war resistance from Russia, we did not pose uh, any 
like politically challenging uh, demands, right? We have a peaceful protest against the war and uh, we were interpreted in this very long lasting tradition of anti-militarism of feminist history, of, of pacifism in feminist history. Um, and then uh, when we realized that, uh, we wrote a short article actually in which we suggested the uh, stop uh, that we should not be used as an excuse uh, not to listen to our Ukrainian comrades. And that was around the time when this letter by Ukrainian feminists on open democracy appeared and other more vocal initiatives from the Ukrainian part. And the fun part was that this article, unlike all other our materials, was not published anywhere. Uh, and that was the moment when we realized what is our function in this kind of public representation of the anti-war activities or anti-war resistance, that uh, in that sense, we kind of uh, create this very comforting image of anti-war resistance, um, peaceful, uh, pacifistic, that uh, has nothing to, like, do not, right? We do not in a way pose any uh, problematic questions. And uh, so now we are trying to fight with this image because our movement is uh, totally not, um, I mean, when we are in Russia, of course, we are not uh, able to uh, support some demands uh, regarding armed um, um, armed support of Ukraine or others, right? Or like sanctions, but like our heart is with these demands. So we, I think that it's important that for us as feminists to emphasize that being feminist and uh, anti-war feminist is actually, uh, actually means something different, not being just pacifist, and deny the, uh, the right for uh, legitimate resistance and self-determination, but rather to consider three important points. And here I will um, end my presentation. So the first one is to think about the war as not a discrete event with a beginning and an end, but to understand that it's just a kind of intensification of the patriarchal violence we live in our entire life and we fight against our um, entire life. So to make sure for us, right, that uh, the um, discussions about, for example, uh, war rapes and war cr uh, sexual crimes uh, will continue and those who, and perpetrators will get their punishment, right? That survivors will have support and that people like refugees who are fleeing Ukraine now will get um, all the needed support, including ab access to abortion in the countries they're going now, as well as uh, protected from threats of trafficking, et cetera, right? So that's the, the kind of first uh, scope of issues that we think um, should be considered as feminists. Uh, second is, as feminists, we also should be supportive of the agency of people, right? And this is, I guess, the trickiest part of this discussion that um, in many discussions uh, or in many representations of the war, uh, women are seen as only victims or at least very often are victimized. So it's really important for us and uh, I think that not only for us to emphasize the agency of women, right? And not uh, only in uh, the army, but also Ukrainian women who are doing uh, ground uh, work with NGOs helping other women, um, etc. And this agency issue is also connected to the third part Part is that our final uh, um, goal is to also keep uh, keep presence of female if we, we will be able to do it, if we are able to do anything at all at that moment but to uh, include kind of feminist perspective in uh, peace negotiations and peace building afterwards, right? And for us as activists in Russia with almost zero political power or access to any type of politicians, it might mean, for example, to use practice of women's courts that were initiated in uh, former Yugoslavian countries after the wars as well, where women um, uh, brought witness, uh, were witnessing their wartime experience and uh, sometimes actual um, court cases were initiated afterwards, right? Because of course those rapers, rapists and those criminals who are in Ukraine now, they come back to Russia. So it would be kind of our goal to make sure that they will get punishment for what they've done there. Um, so that's it. I 
hope, yeah, uh, that's it. I hope I was brief enough and thank you a lot for your time and um, attention. So I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Sasha, for this uh, picture of the anti-war movement and the feminist movement in Russia. And I think your major argument is, has been the, the agency of women probably is a, a major issue in, in the entire discussion. Now we turn to Simon Pirani. Uh, he will also speak to the, to the Russian situation. Uh, as I presented him, he is a specialist on Russia and uh, he is a specialist on the, the fossil economy. And he will present us some elements of the recent uh, Russian economic and political uh, development, and then we come to the we will come to the discussion afterwards. So, Simon, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christian, uh, for the invitation. I'm not sure how much I can add to this discussion after the very rich contributions from our Ukrainian comrades and uh, also from the uh, crazy optimist uh, from Russia. Uh, I think they've said a lot about the sort of anti-war movement, the sort of solidarity movement we want to build with the Ukrainian resistance and that's really the important thing. So I think what I'm going to talk about first of all the Russian economy and oil and gas, and secondly, what sort of regime exists in Russia is really sort of background to uh, the important points that uh, the comrades have all made. So oil and gas, um, historically, uh, Russia is an empire um, and it's acting as an empire in Ukraine now. Um, but in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia was integrated into the world economy as a subordinate country, as a supplier of raw materials to the world market, uh, as a supplier of oil and gas. And its economy is completely dependent on the revenues from uh, it, these exports. Uh, oil and gas comprises about a quarter of Russia's economy measured by GDP, but more significant, oil and gas accounts for 57% of the export revenues that come back to Russia from international trade, 57%. And if you add coal and precious metals, uh, palladium, platinum, uh, nickel, aluminium, and so on, uh, it's uh, a lot more. Now, one thing this raises in practice is the issue of sanctions. Um, there's an excellent website which uh, displays every moment the amount of euros that have been paid by countries in the European Union for Russian oil, gas, and coal since the 24th of February. And uh, I looked at that this morning and it said 39 billion euros. And so, of course, uh, there's been a, a demand uh, from uh, Ukrainian organizations, from Ukrainian trade unions, <clears throat> from Ukrainian comrades for uh, sanctions. Um, and that's a demand that we should all uh, take up. We should bear in mind that uh, sanctions are a difficult instrument to use effectively. Um, the, it, it's very clear that sanctions can do great damage to the Russian economy. And in fact, from the point of view of the Western powers, it could be said that unlike what they were doing between 2014 and February, uh, they are waging economic war on Russia. That was not what they were doing before. The, that economic war is limited. They very clearly do not want to uh, damage their own economies and their own riches and their own power by limiting their purchases of uh, Russian oil and gas, 
but it's substantially more. They're taking substantially more action than they were doing uh, before February. Uh, there's a question, I think, as to whether that damage to the economy can flow through and also damage the arms industry and the military forces in Russia with the speed that we would all want. But um, that, that's perhaps a secondary question. Perhaps uh, from our point of view, from a working class point of view, we should also think about the campaign that Yulia spoke about, about debt. Uh, there's also been talk, particularly here in the UK, where our disgusting government acts as a uh, magnet for all the riches from Russian oligarchs um, to then be siphoned to offshore locations where they don't pay tax. And that's also an issue we can campaign on. Now, I want to talk about um, the nature of the regime. And but I, I've certainly rethought this. And I know that uh, comrades in Russia and friends in Russia who are trying to understand the changes have rethought this over the past couple of months. And I think the regime has changed over the past couple of months. As I said, Russia is historically an empire, but it's in this weak uh, position economically. And in my view, the essence of what we might call Putinism is to compensate for the economic weakness with military strength. And what we've seen essentially since Putin uh, took office in 2000, uh, in the 21 years, 22 years until now, We've seen Russia, led by Putin, being permitted by the Western powers to act as a gendarme in its part of the world. NATO actually supported the Russian regime during the war in Chechnya in uh, 2000, between 2000 and 2003, where many, many war crimes were committed. Uh, it was the sort of uh, war blitzkrieg which we're seeing in Ukraine now. The Western powers uh, allowed uh, Russia to uh, take action in uh, Ukraine in 2014 with a very, very limited response. And actually the sanctions of that time were all linked to the annexation of Crimea, not to the Russian support by bands of Russian, armed bands of Russian fascists uh, for the so-called People's Republics uh, in the Donbass. Now, uh, obviously, the situation has changed in February, and the Western powers have reacted to the all-out invasion uh, by Russia. But as I said, I think the Russian regime has also changed. Um, the way that the regime mobilizes nationalism has changed. Uh, patriotism is now very clearly not only about love for your country, but it's about uh, fighting for that country militarily. There's a big ideological offensive uh, in schools. Um, and the idea of the Russian world, which was always for years uh, current in the Russian right, in the nationalist right, has become ethno-nationalist. But perhaps more important, it's been embraced by the state, by the mainstream, by Putin himself in his language um, about uh, Ukraine not being a country, about chewing up and spitting out uh, internal enemies. And uh, there was an article, which many of you may know, was published in Ria Novosti, it's one of the main uh, state-supported news agencies uh, by this guy, Timofey Sergeyev. Um, and I've seen articles like this years ago on uh, extreme nationalist websites. What's quite... Um, what, what, what's quite relevant to the time we're now living in is that this appeared in a very central established news agency. And it's a fascist-like justification of genocide uh, in Ukraine. And if you haven't read it, I, I strongly recommend it. As uh, the Ukrainian journalists have translated it, you can find it in English on the internet. Uh, and it's worth looking at. And of course, all that plays into the new level of uh, repression, the closure of media, the long jail sentences, for any type of dissident activity. And I think that um, we need to take all this and we need to think about uh, Russia as being in transition to fascism. Um, that's where we are. Um, 
I, I just want to finish by uh, referring to something that uh, Christian said at the start, that uh, the confusion that's been present in uh, the, what I would call the so-called left, the left with quotation marks in Europe, has left our friends in Ukraine disillusioned uh, with that uh, left. And uh, to my mind, and I think it's relevant to say that at a gathering uh, like this, um, the, the category left, the idea of left to me no longer works in the old way. Um, I thought at the time of the conflict in Syria, uh, when the uh, regime was supported by Russia uh, in basically killing its own citizens rather than allowing them a say in the future of the country, I thought that uh, the idea that I uh, was part of something, this left, which also had people in it who supported. Bashar al-Assad uh, was to me uh, I I impossible uh, to imagine. Um, and I think uh, this uh, applies uh, right now in the same way. Now, of course, there, are there's a, it, there is a great deal of confusion in my view uh, about this war. There are voices from the global south who say, yes, we understand about Ukraine, but you know, what about uh, Sudan, what about Yemen, what about Palestine, uh, where we've just seen a big attack on demonstrators uh, in Jerusalem uh, the other day. There are, there's confusion from uh, people who, who have, young people who have a pacifist outlook um, about uh, wh whether to support uh, the resistance. Confusion we should address and we should discuss and we should uh, make clear the situation. But for those who repeat and recycle Kremlin propaganda, uh, for me, they're not part of anything that any of us here are part of. And uh, we need to find a new way of expressing what it is we're trying to do in changing the world, find new ways of expressing what we're trying to do in combating fascism and imperialism. Uh, and that doesn't include, uh, in my view, does not include using that word left uh, in the old way. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon, for the for this um, analysis of the Russian regime, which complements the analysis of Ilya Budraitskis. From, uh, he, he presented us two weeks ago. And uh, of course, this analysis raises very fundamental questions for the entire left uh, in Europe and all over the world, finally, as you uh, concluded your contribution. Uh, now, I suggest that we um, quickly come to the different questions, uh, the different people raised already in the questions and answer. There are different questions. I, I try to regroup them a little bit. There is a question on the health situation in the Ukraine. Uh, Wolfgang raised the question, how is the, the health situation? Because we have the situation of the pandemic and uh, now the war, and uh, there are newspaper reports uh, that the health situation is, is, is almost catastrophic in Ukraine. Is there somebody who can uh, reply or give a short answer to this issue? Then afterwards, I, I will turn to some feminist issues and the issues of labor organization. Is there Alona or Julia or Sachar who can give provide us an answer on this healthcare health situation? Alona. Alona? Yeah, like not an expert uh, opinion at all, but um, um, as a person who goes myself to clinics now and uh, uh, helps, you know, refugees here in Lviv to find some medical care which they need. 
it's as bad as it was before and it did not like worsen that much um mm, at least in uh, regions which are uh, more or less safe like the medical system continues functioning in lviv which of course grew a lot it uh, is still able even to um, um accommodate the newcomers but the problem is that it was uh, being privatized already for some time so those communal services they are available um and i see how like uh, medical uh, today I was in, in a clinic myself and i see how medical staff works more shifts for the same salary uh but the problem is that uh, a lot of services are uh, being uh, privatized so they're expensive and it doesn't matter if you're local or if you're a refugee <coughs> um of course covid is a phenomena you know also at, at at least in the public uh, sphere it sort of disappeared but it's still there and uh, there are still hospitals which are accepting people with covid and people are like uh, now Lviv region is a red zone but no one really talks about it but the hospitals continue working and it's not like uh, completely um you know broken so yeah uh, but it's it's a very you know it's uh, rather my observations is a uh, uh, ukrainian but I, I i was not tracking that much what's going on i don't have any data i could okay. possibly add if, if if you you can you can add afterwards i will turn to the workers or labor union question uh, and yeah. please so uh, there are some issues with uh, Ukrainian medical assistance uh, that there are some <clears throat> cases when uh, the salary is not paid or and uh, <clears throat> there are some many problems of course and um, we tried to help people who face these labor problems in in uh, healthcare system but you know, you should understand that Ukraine traditionally had very powerful medical system, actually. Ukrainians only all frequently comply, you know, say it is bad, you know, it is not that good as it could be, you know, somewhere in Germany if you have money. But it's definitely better than, you know, in Tunis, uh, definitely better than in, you know, United States, definitely more accessible and still function. Yeah. And... Uh, in Kiev, yeah, I, I was I had a neurosurgery just just three weeks ago. Yeah, so all the hospitals are functioning. It is under the um, <clears throat> defense of territorial defense units. Uh, they are controlling entrance and so on. But all the medical staff is present. They um, it's, it's less people in Kiev, not that much hundred people, and you know medical system is functioning and it looks like it is more or less effective at the moment yeah that's it okay uh thank you i guess i'd like to add just like a couple of sentences that like as with um um this kind of movement mass movement of people and the disruption of social fabric as part of the war uh what we have seen is this kind of this you know, dispropor kind of disproportionate, dispersed, in a way, pressures on the system. So, like some of the things that you know, Alona and Sahar have highlighted. So, you know, because a lot of people have left Kiev, there is less pressure on hospitals there. But in places like Lviv or Vinitsa, for example, where there are a lot of wounded are being accepted and there are a lot of internally displaced people, there is more pressure. So, on on certain services, but they are functioning. What, it's just what we're seeing is, of course, there are um, extraordinary pressures and there is this kind of dislocation of demand and supply of those services, so to speak. Uh, and that, of course, you know, we, uh, that, that, of course, opens um opens the space for uh exploitation of ex ex extreme exploitation of the labor force for example in the in the medical 
uh, profession as we've already heard from Zahar, right? So we've, we've heard about delays of salaries and excessive uh, hours and, and, and the rest of it, but the, the system is functioning. There's been some issues with certain, with supply of certain type of medication, not least because uh, people who were fleeing bulk bought certain medications because they, they needed to. But uh, as far as I am aware, uh, a lot of the initial issues have been resolved. It doesn't mean that they are all resolved, um, uh, but uh, it's, the situation is not as kind of chaotic as it was in the first couple of weeks. But of course, there are, there are these uneven pressures uh, on, on the system. But, but indeed, I want to kind of second what Zahar said, the, the, the system of education that was built on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the basis of Semashko model um, is indeed quite resilient and is much better suited for, for the problems that we're seeing now, despite the attempts to destroy it uh, through the medical reforms, it is still kind of life and kicking. There is this issue with, um, you know, with certain charges and commercialization uh, of certain services, that that is a problem. But I think one of the things also for us on the, uh, I'm, I'm going to use this word very cautiously, left, <laughs> Simon, with what with bearing in mind what you said, but those of us who think themselves uh, of, of being more socially orientated, labor orientated, we need to use this opportunity, like and uh, the, the pandemic ex experience, but also this war experience, to bring uh, to kind of to to hold commercialization and privatization of such crucial services as healthcare, because should they have been in private hands, they wouldn't have been able to withstand the pressures that that they are withstanding. Uh, and we have seen it, for example, with the railway uh, management and railway workers' heroic effort to evacuate people in Ukraine and coordinate uh, movement of people uh, under shelling. Uh, through the night, through kind of altering routes for the last minute, you know, those, those kind of fundamental, uh, foundational of public services, they need to be in public hands and under, under direct management of people who work in those enterprises, because they know how to run them best. Thank you. Thanks. Now, I would like to turn to uh, broad, uh, very fundamental question. Um, uh, towards the attitude of the working class. So Ulf Peterson from Cologne in Germany, he asks, uh, he asks, what's the attitude of uh, working class people towards the struggle of left activists, left organizations such as Sociali Ruth and trade unions? Because currently also the Zelensky government attacks, uh, is attacking social rights and, and labor rights. So what's the, the, the situation? On the one side, uh, you, of course, you support the armed defense. Uh, and on the other side, you have to defend yourself against uh, the, the neoliberal uh, Zelensky government. What's, what's the situation? In, uh, how, do you deal, how, you, how do you deal with this uh, double challenge? Can uh, probably Sachar or Julia or Alona reply to that? I can start if... if yeah. Okay, yeah. so of course, uh, the best expert on uh, this is uh, Vitaly Dudin, who is a lawyer and who is uh, conducting most of this work, yeah. Uh, he is, um, yeah, he's very good trained and uh, you know, he is and the team, uh, of course, we, <clears throat> we are monitoring all the activities of, of the government that are trying to push such deregulation bills. And of course, uh, we uh, give, uh, Vitaly uh, makes a precise analysis of all the dangers of, of uh, such new initiatives. And um, he is in close contact with uh, uh, trade unions yeah, with the uh, Federation of Trade Unions of Ukraine and uh, with Confederation of, of Free Trade Unions of Ukraine. Uh, but of course, uh, so it's 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 a big luck that today uh, the big deregulation bill was not voted in Parliament. But um, the 
there were some some you know emergency bills that uh, um, that that were uh, that became law already, and um, of course uh, it it is not possible you know to make any kind of public protest. It's it's war situation here, and it's it's not possible to uh, you know <coughs> to for any public de demonstration you know. <coughs> assemblies in the city because it's 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 uh, martial law and so on but mm, we are trying to provide analysis and uh, write articles and um, apply to authorities apply to unions and so on unfortunately unfortunately uh, some trade unions are also uh, to that you know and under the pressure of war uh, most of the people and even trade unions are in positions that they don't want, you know, to disagree with authorities. And it's very dangerous, of course. Yeah, I would say this is what I know. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Sachan. Now I would like to turn uh, to Ben. Ben is an activist from Basel. Uh, and he is a member of Movement for, uh, for Socialism because he, together with some comrades uh, from Basel and Switzerland and from Germany, he is setting up a solidar solidarity campaign with two or three uh, train unions in Ukraine. And you, just, yes, you can just uh, present this uh, activity in a few words. And I think it's, it fits well to the presentation just uh, Sahar has given us. Yeah, thank you for the possibility to shortly present our campaign. I don't want to steal much time for the discussion, so I make it short. We are planning in, uh, in Basel. I'm active in a local solidarity group and between Basel and Köln, we are trying to set up a solidarity campaign which focuses on trade unions in the Ukraine because we had the impression that uh, Except from the UK, there there is a trade union voice in solidarity with the Ukrainian people is missing a bit. So we wanted to set up a, a campaign that that supports the trade union struggles and acknowledge their important role in in, in defense of the population. And yeah, because yeah, I don't have to to spend much words on this. The trade unions are for us a point of reference for projects to support in the Ukraine, for sure. So we are la launching this uh, campaign to to support for in the first step three specific unions, which are the mining working unions that were important for in defense of cities in the eastern part, then the health union and the train working transport union as a first st step. And we're launching this campaign uh, in regard of first of May to to collect donations then. Uh, we have drafted an appeal which Cedric will share in the chat. It's only in German yet, but maybe you can translate with, with people. Um, this deal is only a draft now, but it will be finished until the weekend. And the idea is, or what I would like to invite you to, is to also take over this appeal and translate it into your languages. You can see our a bit how the logo will look like or the appearance of the campaign, which could be taken, all, taken over as well. And I would like to invite you to translate the appeal if you would be interested, and you can send us the the text, and we will make the make the make it the uh, sorry make it look like this. Um, on the second part, apart from this, we're also we're not only having this appeal that we want to share, but also we would like to collect statements from Ukrainian trade unionists as well as from trade union unionists of the western part of Europe. To, to strengthen a bit these connections and to build up some, some links. So we are collecting, we are already in the process of collecting, but if here are now trade unionists in this panel, or if uh, people are listening, that are active in a trade union in the Ukraine, we would really like to invite you to, to send us statements, call for solidarity or uh, yes, also trade unionists from Germany or other Western uh, European countries would be invited. Uh, the appeal will be uploaded on coming Wednesday, 
on either our side in Basel, which is named Basel against Basel gegen Krieg, Basel against War, and as well uh, on emancipation.org uh, to download and to imprint and then distribute on 1st of May. Yes, this is our like is meant as a first start of an uh, international campaign to support uh, support trade unions in Ukraine and is meant to to start links between these unions and also to to broaden up to other trade unions in the UK. Yes, I think this is it. So to summarize, the goal would be to provide direct support to to trade unionists and their families and to their struggles that they have at the moment against the attacks from the government as well then to to collect statements from trade unionists as well from as as well in ukraine as in east uh, western europe and you're very invited to send me such statements on the to the mail that is also published in the chat and if you would like to translate the appeal you can also get in contact with us via mail and we can look to yeah, we can organize this together. Thank you, and thank you really, really much for your very important uh, contributions. These are really helpful for us in the local solidarity structures as orientation. Thank you very much. Christian de Vistafrum. Thank you, Ben, for providing us uh, this information about this practical campaign. Uh, what is very important to launch that, such activities. Now I turn to Philip from Zurich. Uh, he also will present us uh, 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 some activities. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, hello, comrades. I'm Philip from Zurich, and um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, contributions. It's uh, for us very helpful and, um, to learn about uh, social reality in Russia and, and Ukraine. And actually, I have a question uh, for the for the public, and I want to ask if they're in the public, if there are people from Zurich or other like uh, German speaking, uh, uh, Swiss German speaking cities who want to get involved in actual solidarity campaign as Ben described it. Um, and yes, if, if, if you want to get active in, so in concrete solidarity work, please contact us. I'll write an email address in the chat or you can also write your email address in the question and answer um thing um yes nur noch kurz auf deutsch um, falls im publikum uh, menschen aus zürich oder umgebung um, anwesend sind die konkret aktiv werden wollen in solidaritätsarbeit mit uh, der ukraine dann kontaktiert uns doch wir sind daran initiativen auf die beine zu stellen ja herzlichen dank uh, allen teilnehmerinnen und speakers ja. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. But we have still some questions left. Uh, but I just uh, added the the presentation of these activities because it fitted it fitted well to the question of labor unions. Um, Sahar reported, uh, but there are some other uh, broad or fundamental questions um, still left. Uh, I would like to raise. Uh, Simo and uh, Eugenio, they ask about the feminist connections. So how feminists in Ukraine and feminists in Russia can come together? What's, uh, are there some shared discussion or rooms or is there a shared uh, praxis of uh, and the, uh, sh common learning? How to to yes how to bring the feminist solidarity and feminist movement uh, together in both countries. The, uh, two persons asked a quite similar question. So probably uh, Sasha and Alona can uh, respond to this question. Yeah, probably I could start. Uh, I think it's important to understand the context that. 
in both countries, uh, as in many other uh, Eastern European countries, the feminist movement is quite uh, liberal in general. So yes, there are contexts between the left-leaning feminists and uh, they were there before. They are now are through like left-wing um, organizations and connections. But uh, that's the, that's like the point that we were quite weak before. Uh, and um, that's why now it's so difficult, you know, to start some uh, broad scale uh, cooperation also now of course for uh, Russian feminist comrades it's like really dangerous um, to be publicly active um, some of my like Russian like really good Russian friends from Moscow are being uh, um, checked by police every week uh, police comes to their place and we even had to like change how uh, we are written on Telegram. So like instead of uh, name of my friend, I had to write like books. And she also like uh, wrote that she is uh, not talking to me, but like um, <laughs> orders books online and so on. So uh, the the context we are in is not really uh, you know um, optimistic but of course like from um, I was uh, personally amazed by how uh, Russian feminists responded they were the first one to respond and they were like um, the most organized among other many other uh, civil society organizations um but yeah it's um it, it's also very difficult because we are exhausted we are doing so many things at the same time started from like helping our families to escape uh, to evacuate to organizing humanitarian aim to like speaking and so on but I, I really hope that at some point it will be possible, like Sasha said, that at some point those rapists uh, who, are, who are here and now coming back to Russia, they have to be uh, punished. Thank you. Uh, Sasha, can you uh, provide us with your perception of the, yes, the situation and, and common activities? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Yeah, we are trying to... Okay, so first of all, I agree that uh, with Aliona that I hope that our uh, collaboration will grow after the war, especially, uh, because now, I guess, at least in our initiative, we kind of started acti acting a bit ad hoc, right? Without any clear goal and how to reach this goal, like clear steps how to reach this goal so um yeah and how we so far collaborate or cooperate with ukrainian feminists is by inform through informational support right we try to circulate information we try to support uh demands um, um and we try to also spread leaflets about trafficking as well as we also cooperate with initiatives that help uh, Ukrainian so-called refugees who are in many cases uh, not um, um, like were forced to come to Russia to leave Russia now also in this regard we co collaborate with different initiatives who uh, help uh, refugees and then uh, we also yeah so th these are main kind of ah, and also of course fundraising and uh, fundraising for Ukrainian initiatives and um, we try to amplify voices of Ukrainian women in our informational ch channels as much as we can. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, for us, probably one of the goals will be uh, when the active phase of the war st uh, stops, then we have to deal with this uh, amount of violence that it brought. So that's probably when we will co cooperate more actively. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, here in, in in Europe, in Western Europe, in Germany, and of course also in the other countries, a major issue in the public debate is the, the energy question. And uh, some countries are heavily dependent on the Russian gas. And also I myself was quite often wondering how, how are we able to connect the anti-war movement with the climate movement? I think this is a, a strategically a major issue in many countries. I would like to ask uh, Simon uh, uh, on his opinion on this issue, uh, because it's, it's a very complex <laughs> question. It's a question of, uh, it, it jumps, or it's linked to the question of sanction. Of course, this is the question of the, the energy, a transform, a social ecological transformation of our societies. So all, all kinds of very fundamental strategic questions are, are mixed up in, in this, in this uh, complex. Can you provide us with some, <laughs> some elements? Uh, yeah, uh, well, thank you, uh, Christian. I will try is the answer um, and um, it, it, it is true that uh, what they call energy policy is complicated um, there are many different ways to solve uh, the problems that come up but there are some things about it that are very simple um, so the first thing is um, if you read the newspapers, it looks as though there is a certain amount of energy that, as the newspapers say, quote, we need, unquote. We need this amount of energy for the economy. Um, now, as socialists and uh, who understand uh, something about the way that capitalism works, we have, first of all, to reject that idea. Um, the way to tackle climate change is first of all is first of all to reduce the throughput of energy through uh, these big technological systems that comprise our economy and i'm i'm talking about things that we all uh, see and use every day when i say a big technological system i just mean for example, a transport system. Uh, we can massively reduce the amount of energy throughput through the transport system by getting people out of these mobile metal armchairs that are called cars and having public transport that is cheap, that is nice to use, um, that is uh, that people can uh, use bicycles, they can walk. Now, of course, environmentalists have always presented these issues in a terrible way by uh, implying that people have to suffer, people have to do without. And so our relatively comfortable uh, people in rich countries uh, get very uh, worried that they might have to do without, and the whole conversation gets off to the wrong start. So we have to put forward policies and methods and approaches that bring together uh, climate issues with social issues. So on the thing about transport, let's have nicer cities to live in, let's make it easier to get round and let's stop building roads. I mean, look, of course we should get people out of those flaming great sports utility vehicles, but let's not get too tied up with that conversation let's deal with the priorities now on the priority now from a social point of view is the price of oil has gone up as a result of the war people are being presented with these horrible bills for oil and gas gas to heat their homes it's frightening it's worrying for working class people and uh the the we should uh, socialists we should say look if we insulated if we insulate the houses and if we install heat pumps in those houses, 
then people will have there'll be the energy throughput will be less people will get what they want which is to be warm and not to be cold for their children to be warm and for the gas to be there to cook the dinner so people don't care about energy throughput but what they want is the thing that comes at the end so there's two examples i could go on but i won't because it, it takes time so but we can find these policies to unite social and climate issues and th these are the way to um reduce dependence on gas imports from russia now if i said that uh, to a room full of policy experts they would say oh this takes time to change the infrastructure and so on no it doesn't it doesn't take time to get unemployed building workers and put them to work uh building uh, houses uh with or insulating homes or installing heat pumps or whatever it doesn't take time to have cheap public transport what it takes is state intervention and of course state intervention sounds like social democracy and the, the politics of the last 30 years in all the rich countries has been going in the other direction against uh, social democracy so there are these solutions uh, th th there's there's no one answer to these things but the the dependence on russian gas could be reduced very rapidly with these methods and that's what we in the labor movement should uh, stress and uh, fight for uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon. Could um, I add a couple of sentences? Here? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Simon. It's very important points. Uh, I also wanted to add uh, kind of an, another eco socialist and feminist point uh, to how our economies can be functioning without being obsessed with productivism and eco, uh, with ecocidal productivism. Uh, and consumption and obsession with consumerism like so of course you know the, the whole growth model needs to be challenged but the thing is that even within the parameters of what we have currently be before us there are there we haven't reached the limits of the possible of what can be done and uh, there are some great suggestions from different feminist economists and like not least we, in the UK we have the women's budget group who are stressing that if the governments are investing in care economy and in public services, in looking after the parks, in, develop, in, in insulation and in all sorts of you know, green initiatives, if sectors that are from the outset low carbon intensity are prioritized as those where most employment is created, we can overall reduce the need to consume a lot of energy. At the end of the day, if the government is to invest its money and to pay salaries, for example, of road work as well, they have, they have, they have already decided to spend that money. What difference does it make if they spend it on care workers who enable independent living to the elderly? then the salaries are being made, money is being spent, and this is a very low carbon occupation. So those people are like, those who need help are being taken care of, those who need jobs have jobs, they have salaries, they can pay for, for their dinners, for their holidays. Uh, another thing is something that I think is close to Alona's heart, is that is, that is um, a coordinated city planning. We need to also reduce the need for people to travel all the time. And there was a lot of that in the in the USSR city planning, where every kind of residential area had its own little hospital, had its shop, had its school. You didn't have to do 40 million trips every day to meet your daily needs. Right. So if you if if you we reduce the need to travel and we have adequate public transport that is run on electricity, like those beautiful Zurich trams then we can have a better like we, we, we kind of we can we can phase out the need for growing uh for growing amounts of energy that of course will, will have to come from fossil fuels because it's impossible to comp to compensate with these exploding needs for energy with renewable energy capacity it is simply not sustainable we need to phase out the growing need for energy and then we have better communities we have better quality of life for city and countryside dwellers and we have cleaner air to breathe and uh and people have a bit of cash to spend on having a good time with their friends and family and uh, because and uh, parks are clean and uh, 
eco-socialist paradise is around the corner. Okay, thank you very much, Julia, for these uh, additional, very fundamental and broad-based uh, reflections. I would like to come back to the current situation in Ukraine, uh, because there are uh, some more questions, uh, some people raised some, some more political questions. Uh, we have Bernd Gerke with us. He is a veteran of the move of the democratic movement of the, of the former GDR. He asks, uh, are the, the Ukrainian leftists in the resistance struggle striving for a visible independent political profile? And are they perceptible for the population as leftists? So it's uh, a little bit the question of how to deal right now in the current situation with the problem of independence. Uh, is, is it possible? to create uh, a, some kind of socialist or left pole or progressive public pole uh, front in the Ukrainian society? Or is it much more difficult? <laughs> Who can answer to this question? It's a question we are quite often um, asked among leftists in Germany or in, in our countries that uh, there's a criticism going around saying that uh, it's not worth it's 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 a it's a it's a mistake to support uh, the Zelensky army. Uh, we can only support uh, armed forces uh, by, from independent left, but because such an independent left doesn't exist, <laughs> we do not support Ukraine. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> The, what's your answer to this question? Uh, Zachar or Yulia or Alona, doesn't matter who wants I can to start. Yeah, I can start uh, if, if it is okay. Uh, you know, the independent left exists. Uh, yeah, there are uh, ter territorial defense units which are organized mostly from, from anarchists and uh, some radical socialists. Uh, the problem is that. Uh, you know, in Ukraine, we don't have, and it's it's very good that we don't have a guerrilla um, civil war or everybody against everybody. We have a big full-scale war, yeah, full-scale invasion of, of the massive army. And uh, it would be, you know, kind of idiotic position to arm, uh, to help some guerrilla fighters uh, when... Uh, you have a uh, you know full scale uh, arm, army with all the all the modern weapons invading the country. You know the material force could be could be faced with other material force, and uh, you can't fight against the you know supersonic uh, and um, cruise missiles uh, with, with uh, just you know some. Uh, some guerrilla fighters. But, of course, it is a problem. Yeah, I said that it is a problem that uh, most of people, most of organizations uh, of the unions, of the left, you know, are trying to support the, the war effort of government. And uh, some it, it makes problems. And, uh, well, of course, we as social we are we have our uh, independent initiatives uh, and we clearly declare ourselves a radical socialist a leftist yeah so everybody knows who, who we are yeah and it's our projects to support uh, <clears throat> to, to, to support um, people who need legal advice in in some law cases it's uh, our activities to support some territorial defense units uh, to to support refugees and so we we are acting as a left openly as a left force but of course uh, it is not it is not clear how the situation will develop because there are some attempts of of uh, right <clears throat> far right <clears throat> political organizations to use the situation to suppress any kind of left and uh, any kind of opposition yeah we are criticizing 
the government in some issues of uh, labor law and deregulation. And the government is trying to suppress all kinds of opposition. And at the moment, you know, we are still acting openly. And, um, but of course, you know, situation is very turbulent in Ukraine. Yeah, the fighting is going on and uh, everything could happen, unfortunately. Thanks. Uh, Alona, uh, what's your point of view on, on this question? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm not going to go in details, just <clears throat> I support Armin of Ukraine and if people, you know, want to support, if they're questioning this, I do not think we have to explain why and spend our time on this, but if there are some ex-comrades who uh, want to support uh, independent left in Ukraine who is fighting, I'm, uh, you know, sending links now, please, you know, when you're being drafted in this kind of uh, discussions, which I perceive as completely useless, at least for myself, because please just send them uh, our um, organizations, which are uh, supplying now uh, uniforms, supplying uh, gadgets for our comrades who are fighting now. Uh, we still need money because yeah, there are like more and more people joining, uh, the war goes on. And I think it's like the best way, you know, to answer these uh, questions about, oh, okay, uh, why should we support Ukrainian army? Okay, you can support left-wing activists who are now defending you. Okay. Uh... Thank you, uh, thank you, Alona, for, for this very practical answer from, based from the concrete situation. Uh, is there still some question left? I do not see, uh, probably I would, as a final point, probably before I close the, the debate, uh, also linked to, to this uh, weapons question. In, I think in, in the left, in the German-speaking countries, mostly in Germany, but also in Italy, uh, the, uh, 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 broad perce uh, perception, which is widespread in different currents in the West, is that this is just a war between great powers, between uh, imperialist powers and uh, Ukraine is just a proxy of NATO, nothing more. So, and uh, therefore they argue uh, those who support the Ukrainian resistance are on the side of the Na of NATO and the US imperialism and so and so on. Uh, this is a very uh, it's a quite broad discussion in, among uh, radical left. What would you argue against uh, this uh, widespread perception in different currents of, of the left? Uh, probably to close, <laughs> to, 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 yes, to, to close the, the, the meeting. Sacha? Yes, thank you. Well, I would say that uh, you know, Putin decided to de-Ukrainize Ukraine, yeah, and uh, said that there are no Ukrainians, that uh, uh, we are just just some the same people as Russians, so we are just don't exist, yeah. And unfortunately, among the Western left, it is also kind of tradition of denying the subjectivity of Ukrainian people, you know. Of course, you know, in any moment, somebody is trying to use you. Yes, there are many different imperialist cultures. There are Western imperialism. There is a Chinese imperialist, probably. But it is Ukraine, you know. We are, we are just existing as people, you know. <laughs> and uh, our imperialist forces invaded to our country, you know. And uh, it is, it is just uh, such a Sharonist bullshit, you know, that it's really hard to comment on such things. Thank you. Okay, uh, Julia. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I second Zahar's sentiment. Uh, you know, the thing is that um, we live in, in a capitalist world, unfortunately. And no matter how many competing imperialist powers in it exist and who falls within their, what the Russians like to call spheres of interest, it doesn't mean that people who live in those spheres of interest do not deserve to be defended or protected from these uh, narcissistic entitlement claims. Um, I think the prism of domestic violence here is actually quite useful as an illustration of whether one should interfere or not. If your neighbor beats his wife because she decided to leave, do you call the police? Because you are, you know, it, or, you, or he had a bad day at work and he beats his wife. Do you think she needs to be protected just because she's really not the reason of his bad behavior? This is simply uh, like this. This is like this is a, an argument of radical stupidity. To not protect Ukraine, you know, who cares what kind of empires are fighting for it? If we were talking about liberation struggles on Latin American and African continent, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Why are we having this conversation over Ukraine? It's a sovereign country that has that has become sovereign through a process over over an all national referendum where people, its population, overwhelmingly voted to want to to be a separate country. When did it become okay to not uphold international law and international liberal order, however illiberal and imperfect it is, simply because, you know, oh, it's between US and Russia. Well, there are Ukrainians in between. There, there, there are people, there are children, there are their homes, there are their gardens that have been bombed and destroyed and raped. And not helping them is, a, is an utterly immoral position. It's completely indefensible. And I do not think that anybody who holds that position have, has the right to call themselves as those being on the left. That's my view. Uh, thanks. Now, uh, Simon, you also want to add some remarks to this issue? Well, just really quickly. I mean, first of all, there are many uh, political answers uh, to this. So, for example, if Ukraine is fighting a proxy war um, of uh, the US, then we should say that the Palestinians are fighting a proxy war on behalf of the Arab states. Or we should go back further and say that the Vietnamese were fighting a proxy war on behalf of the Soviet Union and China. Uh, so. But these political arguments show how completely illogical are the uh, stances that uh, you mentioned, Christian, but I don't think that really gets to the heart of it. I think the heart of it is what Yulia and Zakhar have mentioned, which is that, uh, you know, there are people now, I mean, we're in a concrete situation where people now, if, if I, I was very, very forcibly struck in the first few days of the war by these numerous photographs that appeared on the internet of Russian speaking Ukrainians in Kherson, in, uh, in, uh, in Melitopol and all these other areas of southeastern Ukraine, literally uh, trying to fight tanks with their bare hands. Now, if socialism does not mean supporting working class people on the other side of Europe who are in that situation, I don't know what it means. And it, it was for that reason that I said, I think really the, the it, 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 it's not really the job of our Ukrainian friends and comrades to sort out this messed up thinking uh, in the so-called left uh, in the West. I think we have to uh, get an understanding of how such completely upside down and, and inhuman views of the world. I mean, it's an inhuman view um, to uh, it, it's an inhuman view to dismiss those people in Melitopol or Kherson as some sort of agents of uh, American imperialism. It's inhuman and inhumanity is completely incompatible with uh, socialism or any kind of politics of radical change. Uh. Yeah, I would like just to add a small joke, which is like going uh, around the internet now, like 
Ukrainian kids wake up in the morning, they have their breakfast, and they go to school, not to the NATO, they go to school. <laughs> because probably in the image of some pro-Russian leftist, like Ukrainian kids wake up and go to the NATO. No, they still go to school, believe me. Okay, thank you, uh, Alona, for this uh, uh, joke. Uh, I would like to close the meeting, but before that, I would like to give you uh, all just the opportunity, opportunity to uh, uh, to make one or two additional sentences. Probably, I would like to uh, begin with uh, Sasha. Uh, that she can uh, bring us back a little bit to the situation in Russia, and then uh, you, each of you, can add some what your most important issue <laughs> in one sentence, just to close. Sasha, would you like to add something about your perception or and or the the the, the problems, the challenges in in Russia? Maybe someone else can start. <laughs> really. Okay. 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 One final sentence, Sachar. Oh uh, yes. Uh, thank you. No, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I would say, uh, um, you know, I I witnessed some worker strikes on in Ukraine, and uh, they always started. Uh, not not particularly for some uh, material reason, but they started from the moment of dignity. Workers wanted to be treated as human beings, and uh, uh, wanted you know manage <laughs> wanted to respect and respect to their dignity. And if we don't respect the dignity of Ukrainian people their right to you know to elect the president zelensky whatever good or bad he is the right of ukrainians to have their own state because they just want to have their own state we can't advocate any kind of uh, left politics any kind of social change politics any kind of justice because we will just deny people some basic for justice that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Julia, you would like to add? Uh, yeah, just um, another thing that was kind of on my mind, and I think it's important to, because it will dovetail with what Zahar right now said, because, you know, we, like any, to me, any socialist, any progressive movement must center workers, must center live in labor. And, and planetary survival. Without that, I do not know what kind of movement that is, but it's something else, some sort of red-brown cocktail that should have really stayed in the past century. Because when we, on the 9th of April, the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign has had um, a demo in London with the support of the biggest trade unions in the UK and the Confederation of Independent Trade Unions of Ukraine who and the and social movement all support in it. And the attacks that we have seen from uh, some of the some of the people who are a bit confused about where they should be ideologically have been absolutely outrageous. And to my mind, if your politics do not center the living labor and the labor movement and do not support their demands, but, ex but unless they, do, they coincide with what you think they should be, well, that smells a bit of authoritarianism and Stalinism to me. We need to be building solidarities and supporting people in the dignity and trusting them that they are not stupid. They have their consciousness and their agency and they know what's good for them and we need to support them without imposing views of how other people should live because we think we know better because no, we don't. So understanding that we need to, understanding that solidarity means listening and supporting and not imposing 
is I think something that some internationally still have to do as homework. Um, so yeah, centering living labor is the basis of solidarity. And I hope that we can continue these uh, dialogues that we started today in, in that spirit. Thanks. Alona, would you like to add something? Yeah, and um, I wanted to just to say that, you know, to reach what Yula is saying, it's important to build this kind of communication, which is being built now. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to the way you built the panel. You invited people from Ukraine, people from Russia, and you're asking them directly. And this is the way we, we, we have to build this communication in this kind of situations, not like uh, 10 uh, white male experts. I've, I've been to such a panel yesterday <laughs> as a listener, and that's at least, you know, uh, first steps to rebuild how we um, practice politics. Yeah, so thank you. Okay. Uh, Sasha and Simon, uh, you already you presented us all you wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for coming. I would like to repeat some practical issues. Uh, first of all, Alona provided us with a link in the chat. Uh, it's the link to the organization of Sociali Ruch. It's uh, ref.org.ua. And there is a, a site, a web page uh, providing us with information about um, accounts uh, and uh, it's a campaign for financial aid for the political work of Social uh, I suggest that you go to this website and uh, use your bank account and uh, make a donation of your capacities for Social Ruch. There is also uh, another campaign which is very important, very, very excellent. It's called Operation Solidarity. As far as I know, it's a campaign launched more by anarchist comrades. It's a very practical campaign of solidarity with medical equipment and all kinds of stuff, what is needed in, in Ukraine. Uh, please go to this website, uh, it's uh, operationsolidarity.org, uh, uh, you will find it, you, you see it also in the chat. Then, uh, as Ben from Basel and Switzerland has been presenting, um, uh, some local different groups in Switzerland are preparing a labor union solidarity uh, activity. Uh, I saw in the questions and answer that Hanna Perekoda from uh, uh, Lausanne, who originally is from Ukraine, she is also involved in solidarity activities. She was with us two weeks ago with a similar conference. And of course, these different committees that are emerging in different cities in Switzerland and Germany or <laughs> other places in the world, they have to try to connect themselves. And I think if this meeting and this conference uh, can be helpful to create such connections, of course, that's, uh, yes, it's a practical issue, it's, it's helpful. Then, as far as I know, there's a, a question or a project going on or being prepared of a delegation of uh, politicians and labor unions going to Ukraine and to, to make these uh, connections. We have already been preparing on Zoom, but uh, to make these connections concrete and practical and physical, this is another activity. And uh, probably we as uh, Emancipation or Movement for Socialism or other organizations, we will go on organizing such similar meetings, probably more focused one, more on specific topics, 
to have uh, uh, more time to deal with specific questions. But I thank you, everybody. I thank all panelists for joining us, uh, presenting their point of views, their experiences. I think this sharing experiences between uh, among different countries in Europe, but between the the, the former so-called Eastern Europe and Western Europe, it's very essential uh, that we do that. Uh, we should have done it already many years ago. <laughs> we didn't, <laughs> but <laughs> at least uh, in this catastrophic war, we, 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 we started to do it too late. Uh, I, I suggest that all panelists stay some minutes with us that we make some 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 um, uh, uh, some balance some feedback round among us and that we will have the, the opportunity probably to exchange some practical issues but uh, I thank the public um, I hope this meeting was uh, an impulse for further activities. And finally, and th this is very important, I thank all the interpreters. It's a huge work uh, we, they have done. Uh, they did it always uh, directly. And uh, this interpretation, these translations are a very important element really to bring people together from different uh, parts of the world and even in, in Europe. Thank you very much for helping us, for helping this uh, as an activist uh, activity. Uh, uh, thank you very, very much to all uh, interpreters. So I Please, uh, panelists uh, and organizers from the different uh, groups and organizations, uh, stay.